Hi, Florian. Great to meet you here over Zoom. Nice to meet you as well. Hello. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're staying up late uh, to talk to me. You're in Vienna right now. Uh, you flew in actually this afternoon uh, and you've just come out of a rehearsal. Who are you rehearsing with and what are you going to be performing? Um, it's a recital tomorrow at the Concert House, and it's uh, uh, a Schumann program. <clears throat> I'm actually joining forces with an actor who's reading a very interesting short novel, or rather extracts of this short novel, by the author E.T.A. Hoffman, who was mm -hmm. one of Schumann's favorite authors. And both artists cross-inspired each other, because obviously Schumann was not just a composer, but he was so interested in literature as well. He was a poet himself. And also, interestingly, E.T.A. Hoffman also was a composer, not a serious one. But he did put pen to paper and he did write a few rather interesting pieces. Mm, it sounds great. I was on your Facebook page. I know that there's some big news that you received. Uh, you're going to receive, am I right, the 2023 Schumann Prize from the city of Zwickau. Can you talk about the prize and who's been, uh, who else has been given the award? Well, I was, I was uh, really excited and very thrilled and humbled to learn just a few weeks ago that uh, I was shortlisted for this prize. Um, it's an award that they give every two years. Zwickau is Schumann's birthplace, and they've been allocating and awarding this prize um, since 1964, I think. And there have been some very distinguished uh, artists who have won this prize in the past, like uh, Emil Gilels, um, Daniel Barenboim, Alfred Brendel, and so forth. And some rather interesting composers, um, uh, conductors as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to say, as I uh, s s messaged you, uh, I have really been enjoying listening to your recordings of the, of the Schumann uh, cycles. Uh, you've recorded all of Schumann's works on 19 <laughs> CDs. When you started recording Schumann's music, did you have it in, your, in the back of your mind that you wanted to record everything and the i guess my other question is where did you start in fact that was the plan when we first started in 2010 or rather a couple of years before as we started devising this program yes the idea was very much to record everything but little did we know when we embarked on this project that was originally intended to be like a 14 cd box and then as we went along we discovered more and more and more so it ended up being actually like 18 or 19 CDs. And um, right from the outset, the plan was not to record these discs in a chronological order, but to come up with particular themes. So for instance, um, the second one is called The Young Virtuoso, because that was a very interesting creative period in Schumann's life when he was still very serious about becoming a concert pianist. And then subsequently, all the works that he wrote around that time were, were marked by a great sense of virtuosity and flashy scales and all sorts of technical difficulties. He did abandon these plans, as we know later on, and to turn more to composition and gave up the piano, which he left for Clara, who was actually a much better pianist in the first place. Um, but then during his rather long creative life, and his piano oeuvre does actually sp span like 40 years, almost 40 years, um, he did have different periods. And uh, there were, of course, preoccupations with particular genres like the sonata form or the variation. Another very interesting thing was counterpoint. Schumann, as we know, was a great admirer of Bach and a great admirer of Mendelssohn, who in turn uh, was a very strong advocate of the works of Bach. And so it's hardly surprising to see that Schumann found great interest in counterpunct lines and in polyphonic textures. And one of the discs is dedicated to the city of Vienna, where Schumann had a rather brief stint as a composer, hoping to make out a career for himself, and wrote various pieces, including, of course, the famous Faschingsschwank from Vienna. Mm -hmm. um, so, like I say, there, there are different themes or different topics, and the CDs have been arranged rather in that particular order um, to give us a story about who Schumann really was as an artist, as a human being. Mm -hmm. There's even a CD dedicated specifically to E.T.A. Hoffman, right? That's right, yes.
Mm -hmm. One of the one of the reasons I love Schumann's piano music so much is he was such a master of the piano miniature. He creates these wonderful moods and pictures in just, you know, four or five minutes worth of music. And one of the things that struck me about your recordings was the contrasts that you put uh, very often in these piano cycles. When you're playing them, are you constantly thinking about Floristan and Eusebius? And can you talk a little <laughs> about who Floristan and Eusebius were in regards to Schumann? Like, how did you, when you approach Schumann's music, especially in the piano miniatures, are you constantly thinking about these two characters? Mm. Interesting question. Yeah, of course, it's it's there. I mean, this this um, this kind of how can you describe it? This dichotomy between the two personalities uh, that. Schumann sought to embody in his compositions, they're the opposing poles. So Eusebius being the calm one, the one who's sort of more reflective, maybe more poetic, maybe more inward, introvert. And uh, Floristan was the flashy one. He was the one who was very passionate and rather fiery temperament, uh, adventurous, always keen to push boundaries. And Schumann felt inside his soul as a musician, these contrasting or opposing poles. And in his piano music, he was somehow looking at the possibility of reconciling these opposites. Um, though, as we find very often, these two rather extreme sides seem to stand for themselves and they do come in touch. But what is so surprising about Schumann's music is that within no time, just a flash of a second, he seems to be changing gear and he goes from the Eusebius character to the Floristan. Now, if we compare this to the way Beethoven wrote his compositions, and it's not really so much earlier. I mean, uh, when Beethoven died uh, in 1827, Schumann was already 17 years old and he was already mm -hmm started to become a, a serious composer and, and musician. So Beethoven is actually not very far away. And yet he seems like a million miles away in many ways, in many regards, in terms of his actual style of composition, where Beethoven's approach seems to be, may I say, a lot more unified or symphonic. And then Schumann's music in particular is made up of these incredible contrasts and, and these fractures and all these sort of sudden outbursts of things that come around totally unexpectedly. Mm. Uh, so you've recorded all of the piano music. I, I have to, one of the thing, questions that crossed my, my mind is that do you start to predict where Schumann's going? Like, do you get more and more familiar with his harmonic language? And do you sort of, can you, like, the more you got into it, could you sort of predict where he was going to go? Did you get how did how did that work, or was it always a surprise with whatever you were performing and learning? There, there actually, because this project has been going on for more than twelve years, there is an element of this. There is an element that the more I was sort of delving deeper and deeper and approaching discs number six, seven, and eight, I was really feeling I was in very familiar territory. Not just because I had been playing the pieces in in concert, of course, not all of them, but obviously the majority, and it's always a good idea to play the major pieces in concert, but it's not just that. It's that Schumann as a person, as a character, seemed to be so familiar with his twists and turns of harmony that I felt, yeah, it's something that I'm really very familiar with. But then again, being a genius, of course, he never fulfills all the expectations 100%. Um, there's always somewhere where he deviates from the expectation. I think that's really making him such a great composer that he's always coming up with some unexpected surprise. Mm. So you were you touched on this earlier. Uh, his early piano music is very virtuosic and the later stuff is not so much. How much of that do you think, I, from what I was reading about him, he had an injury to the hand. It was did that play a part of the equation as well? As well? He did. He. he um, I mean, I think one of the key experiences that he had. I think it was in Frankfurt in eighteen thirty or eighteen twenty nine that he heard Paganini perform, and that must have been electrifying, especially so for Schumann. 
and it did change his life. And his previous attempts to really learn the instrument had been somewhat half-hearted because his plans to become a musician had also been part marred by his parents who insisted that he should learn a proper profession. So he started becoming a lawyer in the first place. But then I think this experience of hearing Paganini life gave him a real shock in a positive sense. And that's where he started to say, I'm going to roll up my sleeves and I'm, I'm going to be a really brilliant concert pianist myself. Um, but he wasn't. And as a result, he did experiment with all sorts of contraptions, which he also built himself. His teacher at the time was Friedrich Wieck, later to become his, his father-in-law, uh, somewhat involuntarily, of course, as we know. <laughs> but there was this, and Schumann actually, young Robert, did live with Wieck in his house. That's how he met young Clara. Um, and Wieck was a very dedicated teacher, and I think he had a very systematic approach to playing the piano, especially when it came to piano technique. So it's it's not surprising that Schumann extended on those pedagogical techniques that Friedrich Wieck taught at the time. And Schumann, being such a restless mind and such a creative personality, he started building particular contraptions and machines to exercise his fingers, especially um, his fourth finger, which, as we all know, as pianists, is the weakest finger you have. And I had a look at some of these machines, it's very interesting stuff where he had a sort of small rope that was attached to a weight. And the idea was to lift the finger with that added weight to give it just more energy, like a sports person would go to the gym, quite frankly. Right. But it played havoc with his health, with his fingers. And then, um, you can read all these rather interesting reports in his diary that he got up very early in the morning to actually go to a... Um, um, an abattoir, I think you call it, where um, and he, the doctor said you must you must put your injured hand deep inside the intestines of an animal that's been slaughtered recently. I mean, <laughs> I'm think I'm thinkable in terms of modern medicine, but this is what poor Robert had to do, hoping to save his hand, but it never really worked. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's especially it's that probably was the crunch point and the turning point was that I'm going to leave piano playing to young Clara and <laughs> concentrate on composition. I'm glad he did. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to wrap the conversation up this way. Uh, you're on a desert island and you have one Schumann piano cycle or one sonata uh, that you have. What is it? Ha <laughs> ha. Wow, that's a really difficult one. It changes. It changes, of course. But um, I mean, at the moment, maybe because I've I've been teaching it quite quite a lot recently, it would be the symphonic studies, episode 13. And especially because mm -hmm. there are three different versions of it. Uh, some of the uh, later etudes that Brahms tried to integrate into the whole fabric. And there's some wonderful, wonderful pieces amongst those. Mm-hmm. Gloria, this has just been great. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Good luck on your upcoming concerts. And uh, please keep in touch if you have any other uh, recording projects coming down the pipe. We'd love to get them to air. Uh, I'll let you get some sleep. Thanks again. Thank you very much.